Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in his book, The Imperial Presidency, says that, uh, I don't remember the, the exact quote, but it's something to the effect that the story of the growth of the presidency is as much a story of congressional abdication as it is of power-hungry executives. And so you do see, particularly in the area of war, there's a, a repeated phenomenon where Congress punts to the president because they don't, uh, they don't want the, the responsibility that the Constitution gives them. Uh, the, uh, as I, I point out in the book, I'm certainly not the first person to make this point, but uh, the authorization that we got for the Iraq War in October 2002 is structured almost the exact same way as the authorization for the Vietnam War in the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in that it doesn't, it doesn't have the, uh, the directness of, say, a formal declaration of war that says, okay, we're going to war. Uh, what both the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and the October 2002 Resolution do is they say, uh, you know, the president has all the power to use all necessary and appropriate force should he decide that, uh, that, that he wants to. Uh, and in each case, it was several months after the passage of the resolution before the war ramped up. Right. Now, one of the reasons Congress does that is because Congress, uh, it's very advantageous for, uh, for any individual uh, congressman or senator to be able to, uh, to, to give the decision to the president and hedge their bets. If the war goes well, they take credit. Uh, if the uh, if the war goes badly, they, they blame him. They're not they're not implicated in the decision. So you actually have, you know, people who can say they were sort of for it before they were against it, <laughs> uh, and they they they, they can't, uh, you know. And you saw the couple. You saw the uh, Hillary Clinton has said that she wasn't voting, even though she voted for that uh, resolution to give the power to. The president to go to war. She she says she voted so he could be in a better negotiator or something. Right, and Kerry said the same thing. Right, and I think that as you said at lunch, and all of us knew at the time, this was a this was a authorization, more than an authorization. This was a decision. Go fight. But we're putting it the last uh, in anal last analysis. We're putting it in your hands. By the way, Gene, you're quite right. The same thing happened in Tonkin, uh, and it took months before there and afterwards. The, the uh, Congress got angry and said, we were never authorizing war. Uh, well, uh, their intent may not have been to authorize a wide-scale war, but when you read the words. Absolutely. Yeah. When you read the words, that was, uh, that was a lot different. Basically, the presidency, as you describe it, and uh, I think all historians would agree with you by, you know, almost, uh, by and large, uh, maybe except for certain things Jackson did for, one, for the Louisiana Purchase with Jefferson, but by and large, up until Lincoln and the Civil War, the presidency was not the policy-making uh, branch of this government. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, uh, as you point out, there, there are debates about this, about when the, uh, the so-called modern presidency really uh, came about. Yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly hints of what the office was going to become in the 19th century, uh, in Jackson's claim to be a tribune of the people, in Lincoln's uh, uh, vigorous exercise of war powers during the Civil War, um, but initially uh, the the office, as the office was designed to be, it had a more modest role, uh, particularly in legislation. Uh, you know, there are several occasions. It sounds weird to read these things today, but uh, where Washington writes a private letter saying, you know, he he felt a little sheepish about making policy recommendations to Congress, and he didn't want to. Uh, to, to make it sound like a tone of command. Uh, the State of the Union address, uh, you know, the first two presidents uh, delivered it in person before Congress. Jefferson said that this is like a speech from the throne, and he thought this was not consistent with, uh, you know, small r Republican principles, and so he had it messengered over. And that, that tradition held for uh, 112 years, I believe, until Woodrow Wilson. Uh, who had a very different idea of what the presidency should be, uh, changed it and began delivering it in public. And then you see it, uh, it goes over the radio. It becomes, uh, in the Truman administration, it goes out on TV for the first time. LBJ moves it to prime time. And yeah. so now you have the, uh, the speech the, as we know it today, which, uh, you know, everybody uh, gets up and claps, uh, you know, every 10 seconds in the speech. And it's a laundry list of policy commands. Uh, well, this, was, uh, this is very inconsistent with the, the president's initial role. The president was not supposed to be 
um, a populist leader who would issue uh, policy commands to the legislative body. The president's role was really, for the founders, much more of a defensive role, not only in foreign affairs, where he had the power to repel sudden attacks, um, but also in domestic affairs. He, he was, uh, Congress was supposed to be the, uh, the real uh, locus of action. Right. The president was, uh, was sort of a goalkeeper. The veto was, uh, uh, was there so that he could uh, check Congress when it tried to do anything too rash or when it transgressed its constitutional bounds. But he was never supposed to be uh, the figure that everyone looks to to uh, solve whatever the problem yeah. of the week yeah. is. That would this excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.